Emotion AI, uh, tell me what that is and why the people in this room should care about it, what it means for business. Well, if you think about human intelligence, it's not just about your IQ, right? I mean, as leaders and in our professional and personal lives, your emotional intelligence matters, you know, perhaps more importantly than your IQ. And that's true for technology as well. As AI becomes more mainstream and starts taking on roles that were traditionally done by humans, like acting as your personal assistant or hiring your next coworker or driving your car, or, you know, assisting with your healthcare, um, it's really important that technology doesn't just have lots of IQ but also EQ. And so we're on this mission to bring artificial emotional intelligence to our devices. Well, so how can you get a device to, to recognize emotions? How can you exhibit EQ when you're a machine? Yeah, so the way people communicate nonverbal signals, um, only 7% actually of how we communicate is in the choice of the words we use, is in 7%. the actual text, only 7%. Oh, okay. 93% is nonverbal, and that's split between your facial expressions as well as gestures and vocal intonations. So we focus, a big part of what we do is focus on the face and uh, building, using deep learning and machine learning to build algorithms that read your expressions. Can you show me how that works? Yeah, so let's try a live okay. demo. All, all right. right. I've been warming That's, up my face all day yeah. today, so <laughs> I was hoping. Yes, let's give this okay. a shot. All righty, so let me come. All right, okay. so start with your best poker face. My best poker face, okay. Okay, great. <laughs> so as you can see, um, the software has basically identified Matt's uh, face. It identified your gender as male based on how you look. So and, far, so good. <laughs> and then it's locked onto the main feature points on your face, so your eyebrows, your eyes, your mouth, your lips. Um, and then let's test the software. Let's start with the simplest expression, which is a smile. Okay. Pretty universal. All right, 100%, that's a great smile. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, and then let's cycle through those. So okay. Look surprised. Okay, looking surprised. <laughs> you can see that it's also mapping Matt's dominant uh, expression to an emoji. Um, Always one of my own, okay. <laughs> um, well, how about a brow furrow? Brow furrow. Which is the corrugator muscle, it's an expression of, yeah, anger, exactly, or confusion. Smirk, if you're skeptical and it's an <laughs> asymmetric <laughs> lip corner pull kind of, yeah, you're kind of good, yep, there you go, yeah. <laughs> Disgust. Disgust. <laughs> okay, that's like, an, yeah, that's great. That was disgust and disgusting, okay. <laughs> um, and then, uh, this is my favorite, the lip pucker, which is the Kardashian duck face. That's awesome, all right, 100%. That's the um, one I practiced most. <laughs> um, oh, so basic, thank you, thank you, Matt. Um, <laughs> so, this is just, kind of a, a, a toy app to demonstrate how the technology sure. works. Right now, it can. when we first started, it could only identify three expressions. And using a ton of data and deep learning, it now can read 20 different facial expressions, okay. seven emotions, and we keep adding more and more. So you've gathered this data, this uh, wonderful gallery of my own photos uh, now. What, are, <laughs> what, would, uh, what would Affectiva, your company, uh, do with it? How would you translate that into something that a, a business could use? Yeah, there are a lot of use cases. So 25% um, of the Fortune 500 companies, so a number of you here, are already using this technology to test how people emotionally engage with content. Mm -hmm. For example, video advertising. Um, and then um, the data drives decisions around media spend, advertising spend, targeting. Um, um, so that's one of the initial use cases of the mm -hmm. technology. So these are the kinds of decisions and working in media, I know this, that are often made ag in agonizing ways by dozens of people sitting in a room. Is this kind of a, a shortcut to, to answers or decisions? Um, it is, it's it's um, a data-driven approach to mm -hmm. making these decisions, right? Um, often, as you said, and often, often actually you're making the decisions and you're not the target audience, mm -hmm. right? So if you're targeting millennials, you may not know what will resonate, but now you have a way to test that um, and, and of course, you can test it through surveys, but that's tapping into the, you know, into your cortex. It's not really tapping into the visceral emotional sure. response. That's that the set. The you're in the verbal realm. You're the seven percent exactly. of what we feel, as opposed to the ninety-three percent that we Absolutely. express. Exactly. That's interesting. So you talked. Uh, you talked a little bit about how uh, your own company is working a little bit more in the automotive sector. Uh, tell me a, a bit more about the applications of that there? Yeah, a number of years ago, we started getting approached by um, global automakers, especially in Asia, actually. And they said, you know, this is very interesting what you're doing with emotions. Can you expand that to other states of mind, like uh, distraction or drowsiness? And so now we're very focused on the automotive industry, which is undergoing a ton of disruption, as you know. Uh, one use case is around safety monitoring, so driver monitoring for distraction and drowsiness, sometimes intoxication even. 
But what's really exciting is kind of the continuum of use cases through semi-autonomous vehicles and eventually fully autonomous uh, vehicles where we're understanding how many occupants are in the vehicle, what's their demographic, how are they interacting with one another, and then the vehicle can personalize the experience and, and potentially monetize the riding experience. Oh, so this is a way to sort of change the atmosphere in the car, you know, give, you know, for example, Spotify a way to know which playlist to play or something exactly. like that. Exactly, changing the lighting, changing the type of riding experience. Maybe, you know, you want it to be quiet and zen because you're going to get work done. I want it to be fun. Somebody else wants, you know, to sleep. And, and the vehicle can adapt accordingly. And can you get that, from what you currently know about facial expressions, can you get that much data, that, many, that much information about a person from the images you can access today? Yeah, so the face um, has about 45 facial muscles that drive kind of thousands of ways to express emotions and cognitive states. And we're building our way up through these different um, kind of repertoire of states. So right now we've collected over 4 billion facial frames mm -hmm. from 87 countries around the world. Um, and that's, that data is being used to train and, and kind of validate these algorithms. That 87 countries point that you just made, that's important from an ethical perspective and avoiding bias, right? Because you want a, a broad pool of images so that you, know, you don't accidentally build software that only recognizes white guys who make Kardashian faces <laughs> right. or something like that. Absolutely. I think this is one of the biggest concerns I have around um, AI in general. Um, uh, at the moment, which is, you know, accidentally perpetuating bias that exists in society in these algorithms because we're not paying enough attention to the diversity of the data. Um, and so we are very thoughtful about ensuring that the data is gender diverse, ethnically diverse, age diverse. Um, and then once we have the data, it's all about how do you sample these deep learning algorithms in a way that... Um, you know, rep equally represents different minority groups. I mean, we, I mean, it was really telling actually yesterday that both in the opening sessions with Ginny and Brad, there was a lot of emphasis on facial recognition technology right. discriminating right. against you know women of color and, and other minority groups. Um, and it's not done on purpose, but we have sure. to be very mindful about how we design these things. Sort of the unconscious bias. Exactly. Um, I have another ethical, I guess, concern about empathy and emotion in AI, which is this. Um, not long ago, I was taught that empathy would be essentially the quality that would protect my job from being taken by a robot. Uh -huh. you know, my ability to read your cues and to read the cues of someone I was speaking to or talking to uh, was something that separated human intelligence from uh, digital intelligence. Mm -hmm. And the thought was that that was a realm that would kind of, uh, that empathy-centric jobs essentially would be where humans would be concentrating in this eventual imagined division of labor. Yeah. So with technology like this, what is to stop an empathetic robot from taking my job or any, any right human-centric job? I, I don't think of it as a, as a competition between humans and robots or humans and machines. I, I really think of it with the lens of a partnership. Mm -hmm. So because a lot of our, our communication is digital, I mean, you know, how we communicate, again, personally and professionally is, is often done through digital communication. I think it's imperative that we have emotion AI technology to augment our EQ. Mm -hmm. Like, what does EQ look like in a very digitally driven world? Right now, when you're communicating online, your, your EQ is probably like, I don't know, 20 points lower, right? Yes. Because you're missing all of these nuanced nonverbal communication. So my hope is that our emotion AI technology augments people's ability to communicate with empathy and compassion online. Um, I mean, I actually, I'm a big believer that a lot of the bullying that we see and kind of the, the rhetoric that we see in online communications on Twitter and whatnot is because you don't see the effect people sure. you have on, you know, when, when you send a person a really mean message. You don't know how, you know, you don't see that effect it has on them, so. So weirdly, really sort of technology could uh, make up for some emotional deficits that our misuse of technology yeah, is exactly. causing. One of my favorite, favorite examples around that, so imagine you have a, a nurse, mm -hmm. and the nurse now has a number of home robots, social robots, that take care of patients at home. And, and have the ability to clue in that nurse if the, if, if the patient requires actual human intervention. So it's a way to augment the nurse. You know, the nurse has yeah. now these mini bots. Right, um, but they really work for the nurse. Exactly. I have one more question about ethics, and then I'd like to throw things open to the floor. Um, uh, our CEOI uh, knowledge partner is GenPact, and they recently did a, uh, GenPact recently did a survey of uh, businesses to ask them about their AI uh, strategies. And one thing they found is that only about a third of these companies have a framework in place to avoid the kinds of uh, bias problems, ethical conflict problems that we've been talking about. Um, if a CEO came to you, someone in this room, and asked you how to kind of uh, 
come up with a framework like that, you know, what would be your, your, your quick 30 second piece of advice? I like to think of it about the ethical development and the ethical deployment of AI. So with the development, it's things like data consent and data privacy and, and mitigating bias. On the deployment, it's really thinking carefully about where do we deploy these um, um, AI algorithms and where do we steer away from them. Mm -hmm. So we as a company do not work in the security and surveillance and sure. lie detection space. Sure. Uh, we feel that that breaks the trust we have with our users and consumers. So that's that's what. So development and deployment of AI. Mm -hmm. Is opting in an important standpoint from the person? You know. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So everything we do is opt in, and 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 and, and opt in not just like verbose language sure. that you don't really understand, but actually like words. yeah, like but actually really simplifying it so you know the camera's going to turn on, mm -hmm. who's going to get access to the data. Um, yeah, that's really important. That's great. Thanks. Uh, I'd like to throw things open for questions if anyone has any. Uh, and as always, if you've got one, uh, please uh, stand up and introduce yourself. Anyone out there? I'm looking for the yellow paddle. If not, I have some others. <laughs> oh, uh, up here in the, at the table. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Paula Goldman. I am the Chief Ethical and Humane Use Officer at Salesforce. So I think a lot about hey. the questions you were just asking. And just noting that just in the last few months, face, facial recognition technology has become such a hot button topic. Mm -hmm. You have large portions of the transgender community saying kind of ban the technology altogether. You saw the city of San Francisco say, you know, we're not going to use it in law enforcement. Uh, so there seems to be a very polarized discussion rather than kind of a nuanced discussion about the pros and cons of the technology. And I wonder how you think about how we balance those things so we get the good, right? but also avoid some pretty extreme downsides that people are talking about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I do want to underscore that there is so much potential good out of this technology. One of the areas I'm most passionate about is um, applying this to mental health. So the very first use case we explored was autism. So mm. we help, you know, help kids with autism understand nonverbal communication. But also things like facial and, and vocal biomarkers of depression and Parkinson's and, and um, flagging suicidal behavior. There's so much good and potential um, transformative applications of this technology. So I think we have to, as a community of AI thought leaders and innovators, to really kind of be able to articulate what are the potential for good and what's the potential abuse and be at the forefront of that. I mean. I think legislation and regulation is really key and it's coming, but I don't think we as a community have to wait for that. I think we have to actually kind of self-regulate and, and put some frameworks and, and guidelines in place. Have you, or I should say, has your company ever been offered uh, an opportunity that you decided to turn down for these kinds of reasons? Yeah, we, we are routinely approached by, by kind of surveillance and security and law enforcement um, organizations, but the, but the one example that sticks out, in 2011, we were raising venture money. We were about two months away from running out of, of funding, and we got approached by a three-letter you know, venture arm of a security agency, and they wanted to give us $40 million at the time, which was a lot of money of for us yeah. as a company. And we had to think really hard about whether, because, because the alternative was maybe we run out of money altogether and cease to exist, and I just couldn't, I start, I, I kind of, went back home and imagined what life would look like if we did that pivot. And I just felt that that was not why we started the company. It was not in line with our core values. And so we turned it away, and thankfully, we were able to raise money from like-minded strategic inventor investors. So. I'm glad that turned out to be the case. Um, Rana Alkal-Yubi is the CEO and co-founder of Affectiva, and we're so grateful you were here. Thank you so Thank much. You.